did anybody have a kind of a, like a knot that they couldn't untie or like a what, what the heck does this word mean did, does anybody have any uh speed bumps or like birds nests or knots that we want to maybe unpack first I, I do nick grant go ahead nick um i saw this juxtaposition between original man and how he's describing resurrected man yeah and in all honesty that bothered me a little bit because original man was face to face and then in between no face to face and then face to face is it is the human experience for adam and eve before the fall the same as the human experience for resurrected man and he talks about the three dimensions at the end so that kind of threw me and it also leapt into the idea of free will is there free will at both ends of the spectrum or not because it sure doesn't sound like there's free will for resurrected man, but there certainly was for original. That's a great question, Nick. Oh my gosh, that's a great question. Let's take the next half hour to unpack Nick Grant's question. <laughs> um, uh, well, let's look at this. So original man and eschatological man are certainly worlds <coughs> apart, like literally worlds apart. So they're not, not the same. John Paul's clear on we're not going to, redeemed man doesn't go back to Eden. Uh, when we read Genesis and we hear, you know, the Lord walked with them at the breezy time of the day and they were with God, it's not a face-to-face -face as in the beatific vision. Okay, so it's the experience in the garden with the Lord was certainly kind of veiled in the sense that it wasn't heaven. It wasn't the full glory of God. How could that be? Because when that happens, as we see in eschatological man, our will is so... <laughs> we have we have finally and completely offered our fiat and allowed him to come in you know once in heaven there is no turning back you've reached the climax of love you have encountered him face to face that wasn't in in original man that was uh still the the, the realm of time and space the temporal dimension if god revealed himself completely face to face it would have been overwhelming Right. And how could they how could they say no? So we, we look at that experience in Eden as slightly veiled. Uh, their free will, of course, still intact. They know the Lord, certainly, but it's not the kind of pierced, uh, penetrated knowing we see in eschatological man, as we're going to read today. Right. We're going to read into like what kind of depth of knowledge they had. Uh, so it's a different experience. Um. Does that help a little bit, Nick? Like, It does. Of course, that leads to an argument that man had to fall to enter, to end up in heaven. Well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know that we would, we would say that. The idea that um, the Lord was using the experiences of human life in the beginning as preparatory, right? Like the pedagogy of creation, the way he's revealing himself through sacramental signs to them, drawing them through, uh, preparing them. If they hadn't sinned, uh, Aquinas posits like maybe the incarnation would have happened anyway, like love would become flesh. Uh, it's not like we made him become flesh because we sinned, right? We didn't force God's hand. Uh, there, there's even talk in John Paul II here in TOB where you know, the, you know, he. We were saved in Christ before the world began. the The plan of God to become incarnate may have always been there. So we didn't change the plans of God. Like that's audacious, right? To think like we we screwed it up, and now he's got to figure it out. How am I going to fix this? Um, yeah. Al although our sin, right? The Felix culpa, the happy fault. We got to see the incredible depths of the of the Word made flesh. Now. Not just that he's come and taken on a body for all eternity, but he came and that body was broken. He allowed it to be crushed in the olive press, right? And, and we saw every drop of blood come out. I think we got so much more because of our sin. But I don't know that we want to say like our sin necessitated. Now he's got to come. Does that help? Like, yeah, he's going to come. Okay. I, we could probably keep going on this thought, but I want to pull back a little bit. If, that, if that's helpful a little bit, we could press into the audience. 
Okay. You know, when we talk about original man and eschatological man, we enter that realm of speculative theology where we're kind of like, I wonder if, or, you know, we're speculating a bit and we can't always get hard and fast answers, but we can ruminate a bit. But yeah, I would definitely say that original man is not the same experience of God as that experienced in eschatological man. Right, let's jump, in, jump into the audience. I think he'll peel back the layers on that a little bit more. So, okay. Um, well, the second paragraph in part one is one of those sentences you have to read five times. Let's take a <laughs> look. <clears throat> um, this is section one of 68, paragraph two after the scripture quote. And he's getting right at the heart of it. Like, what, what is heaven? It is this communion. We tasted it in Eden. We got glimmerings and foreshadowings of what it was supposed to be, but now it's with the Lord. So it's reached a whole, it's a quantum leap all the way up. The eschatological communion, okay, the communion in the end, right, of man with God, which is constituted thanks to the love of a perfect union. Now we'll see that's a perfect union of us, body and soul, finally integrated again, made whole, and of our humanity with his divinity. It'll be nourished by the vision face to face. That's in quotes. I'm going to pause right there. It's nourished. The communion is nourished by a face-to-face -face encounter. Let's press in. The Lord now has a face. The eternal Godhead has a face. This is crazy. God has a face, right? Jesus, uh, John Paul II says, I don't know where, but he says, Jesus Christ is the human face of God and the divine face of man. Jesus. He's the human face of God, and he's the divine face of man. So the final communion we're made for is nourished by this personal face-to-face. -face. I love this. It's personal, and he has a face. God has a face forever. He's never going to take it off. <laughs> um, I'm just, maybe I'm getting ready for this podcast at 12 o'clock, but the movie Soul is all about, like, the afterlife in this Pixar Disney movie, there's this escalator that goes to the great beyond. And as they're going up, the great beyond is essentially a giant ball of light. And all the souls going up become like, it's almost like a bug zapper. They go up and it's like, bzz, they just enter a big blob of light. We don't get this in, in the theology of the body. We're going to see a face. See, Hollywood doesn't quite get it. The secular culture, it's a big ball of light. But we have a face. That's amazing. Um, I'm still not even done that one sentence, okay? We're not even halfway through the darn sentence. But now I have another, I have a little C.S. Lewis coming in. C.S. Lewis writes that in the end, there will be two faces that we will, one of two faces we will encounter. He says the beatific face or the miserific face. That is so scary, right? The miserific face, of course, is the face of the evil one, right? The fallen one the miserific face. We encounter one or the other. Please, Jesus, bring us to the beatific face, right? Bring us to his face, but it's face to face. Now, let's go back into this one sentence. So we're nourished by it, right? It's life-giving to look at a face. It's life-giving to look at a human face. Imagine the divine face. It's by the contemplation of the most perfect communion because it's purely divine. Okay, there's no fallenness or shadow at all in his face. He's all beauty, all beauty. It's namely the Trinitarian communion of the divine persons in the unity of the same divinity. Okay, now there's a sentence fragment there that is like, what, what? This nourished vision face-to-face -face, is an entrance into the Trinitarian communion of the divine persons. So we are drawn into pure love. It is personal love. And in it, we're fed. We're fed. We're fed. We're nourished. Um, I want to jump. Does that, how, how's that landing on everybody? How's that landing? Do you see how you have to, Nick, it's so awesome that you're, you're offering this group. You guys got to keep squeezing every sentence and all the juice runs out. Don't rush any of it, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
it's like I, I often think of reading theology of the body as like eating a big juicy pear you know when you get a big juicy pear you just take a bite and the juice like just comes down your face every sentence is like that especially in some of these these later audiences okay is it sitting okay any questions or insights of, of your own anybody no. I just want to go to heaven right I just want to go to heaven let's get this thing over with <laughs> okay let's look at num uh, section four which is ridiculously beautiful. Section four. Here, there's a real cool connection. Um, Nick, you brought up like original man, right? Nick Grant. Uh, he's talking in section four of the concentration of knowledge. You remember how in Genesis, Adam knew his wife Eve. And what happened? Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore a son. Do you remember that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, Michelle Grantham. Good to see you. Hi. Popping in down there. Good What's up, you. old friend? Okay. Uh, sorry, I have ADD because I have four children and y'all get it. The concentration of knowledge, as we know from scripture, is not just, oh, that's an interesting fact. How intellectually stimulating. I am coming to know something. When we're talking biblical, we're talking to know the Lord is like akin to Adam knowing Eve, which means they have, the two have become one flesh. Okay, this is so amazing because this kind of knowledge of what the man and the wife experience, this, the knowing that becomes union and then potentially life is the kind of knowledge we're gonna have with God in heaven. So in section four, this concentration of knowledge and he says, vision, because remember, personal, face to face, I see him, he sees me. This concentration of knowledge and love on God himself. A concentration that cannot be anything but full participation in God's inner life. In Trinitarian reality itself, I love how he capitalizes reality, right? Whenever a word's capitalized, you're like, ooh, this is big, this is important. It'll be, here. it's getting crazy already. This will be at the same time, the discovery in God of the whole world of relations. Pause, we have to pause constantly. When we concentrate on God face to face, we know God in heaven, we press in. This concentration and this knowledge of God is his inner life, the face reveals the person. I see his face, he reveals his person, I enter in. Right? The eyes are the windows to the soul. What's it going to be like looking into Jesus's eyes? Oh my, gosh. oh my gosh. If the eyes are the windows <laughs> to the soul, and we're going to literally look in the eyes of Jesus someday. Holy, yeah. holy, holy, right? I also, it's almost like you get so much more. It'll be at the same time, the discovery of God of, in the whole world of relations that are constitutive of the world's perennial order, the cosmos. So as we come to know the Lord, we come to know the whole world. We know the whole cosmos. Do you see that? We know the world. Cosmos is the Greek word for order, right? The ordered world, ah. cosmos. You know, there's movies out there, right? Like uh, these like superhero movies or movies where there's like a guy who, the movie Limitless with Bradley Cooper, I'm thinking of right now like where the brain is actualized, 100% brain capacity we have in these sci-fi movies. There's some grain of truth there, right? <laughs> As we know the Lord, all the vestiges of original sin and all the fallout and the darkness and doubt and shadow and fear and all that stuff is obliterated and we will know the Lord. And by knowing the Lord, we will come also to know everything else that he made, the cosmos. <laughs> Do you ever get lost in something like you, you start learning and studying something and you just love it? Maybe it's like music theory or architecture or, or uh, mathematics or something like you just like, this is so cool. You watch a TED talk, you're like, this TED talk's amazing, you know, about, uh, you know, whatever, nuclear, I don't know, something amazing. <laughs> and you find yourself getting lost in the thing and it's fascinating. Imagine that kind of knowledge of the entire cosmos and yet your brain doesn't explode. And somehow it also doesn't become impersonal ever. You know him, like you love someone, you wanna know everything about him. 
all the little details are important, right? Like I love I love that about you. You know, think about somebody you love. I love all your stories. I love these little things. I love that you love, you know, Cool Ranch Doritos. I love that little fact that you love that 80s band so much. You know, I love all the details about you. When we come to know God, oh my goodness, do you see the, the magnitude here? That we will come to know everything and want to know everything, not as facts for our heads, but because you made this too? Like imagine knowing every bird species on the planet, every insect, every flower, plunging into the depths of what mushrooms are, like the stars, nebulae, the whole cosmos, like, and for all eternity, enjoying everything in the whole order of relations, constitutive of the world's perennial order. Okay, so we can't possibly hold all this right now because our brains will explode. Let's keep going in section four here. This concentration will above all be man's rediscovery of himself. Okay, I, I don't disappear in a blob of light. I actually reappear. I know myself now like I never did before. This is me, my original name. This is my true face, right? I found myself. How many years have we spent on earth trying to find ourselves, right? I'm gonna go find myself. I'm gonna hike the Appalachian Trail. I gotta go find myself. <laughs> That's great, right? You're, we're actually gonna do it. We're gonna find ourselves, a rediscovery of ourselves, not only in the depth of our own person. Okay, me, the mystery of me, the mystery of Ed and Nick and Bernadette and Michelle and Katie and, and Maurice. You're gonna know yourself as God always dreamed you to be in your fullness. You're gonna know yourself, but also in that union, with God that's proper to the world of persons in their psychosomatic constitution. We're going to know everybody else. Psychosomatic constitution, again, is a fancy way of saying body, soul, composite, you, right? Your grandma, your best friend from high school, uh, your colleague, your spouse, your friend, everybody we will come to understand and know. There's, see, here's the point of eschatological man. There's no deficit. There's no, there's no lack or void. It's full of light and transparency and translucency. Mm -hmm. and there's no fear. There's no shadows. There's no doubt. There's no manipulation. It's like, um, you know, I don't know. It's like the experience of looking at a little, a, a toddler, a little kid, you know, the eyes wide open. They don't have the crap that we've built on over the years, right? They don't have all the... Mm -hmm. You know, they're still fresh from the waters of baptism and, and they'll look, you know, you know, have you ever experienced like when you see a little kid and they're like right in your face and they want to tell you a story, I'll tell you a story about my grandma, you know, and they're like, you're like oh. <laughs> for us adults, right? As adults, we're like, whoa, I, I need a little, whoa, whoa, you know, but like, but, but heaven is like all in. Um, this is, <laughs> this is so exciting, right? This is crazy. So um, I keep having that. Um, yeah, Katie, go ahead. Go ahead. When you were talk. talking about the face to face, and then through this, I keep having that vision of like how babies or even like young animals, like they imprint upon oh, yeah. the other. And so then when we're born into that eternal life, like, and we get to see that face to face, like the imprinting we have is from Christ Himself, right? Wow. And so then everything that is in Him is is. Uh, is ours right because yes. like i know who i am because you've imprinted your vision on me so wow all that i have is yours all that the father has given me i give to you yeah all he doesn't say like 80 percent, 65 percent. yeah all yeah. i love that imprinting idea katie wow because like for me imprinting it's like, it, that's like communion, right? Like I'm, I'm in you now and you're in me and I can't, um, I don't want, I want to keep going. I want that right. kind of communion. Wow. Total trust. And I love that. Um, yeah, total trust. I just, I also saw the movie Soul recently and um, the whole concept of the going up the escalator and just becoming like a little bubble. Yeah. And then when he just, he didn't like that. The main character didn't like that. And he wanted to come back and kind of finish his business 
So there was like nothing there for him. Yeah. Like, you know, and then when we get to heaven, there's just like so much more for us and beyond yeah. yes. as opposed to becoming this little bubble of nothing or whatever yeah. it is that's in the movie, you know? Yeah, do you see, th this is the modern Manichaean demon coming back, right? Yeah. That, you know, yeah. you're gonna shuffle off this mortal coil and its body's irrelevant, matter's irrelevant now, it's just all big light. Um, no, we fight that and we should rightly fight that because mm -hmm. that's the disintegrated person. That's not the integrated person. This, this is the integrated person mm -hmm. and it feels right. That's John Paul II's phenomenology, right? How does the science of the real hit your heart? Like, I don't want to get lost. That movie is powerful and those moments burned at right where he's sitting on the sidewalk in the, and he's hearing children's laughter and there's like a crust yeah. of a, a taste of pizza, a maple seed swirls down and lands in his palm. That scene is so intimate. And it's just like, right. he's experiencing it through the body. I love that part. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so this is, <laughs> this is what the glorified body is. And the sense is yeah. not like to, the words of Pope Benedict here, right? The words, the senses are not gonna be discarded, but our senses will be open to their widest capacity. We're gonna get we're gonna drink more if you know we can feel right now like we can feel that that sort of like sea breeze coming in like whoa man i want that but we can um you know it, it's overwhelming right now to try to imagine what it's like to see the full spectrum of, of vision to hear the full spectrum of sound to taste you know taste and see that the lord is good but it's coming that's the promise and we'll have the capacity to receive it um Ooh. Okay. How we do? How's how's everybody doing? I have a I have a question. Nick, yeah. Go ahead. So like I remember reading the autobiography of Saint Therese when she's writing uh, the, about her decision to go into the convent. She was on like one last trip with her family, and she was admiring the beauty of the mountains and everything. And she's like, you know, this is the last time I'm going to see these mountains because I'm going to go into the Carmel and completely. You know, she gives up the beauty of seeing the, all the beauty of the world, you know, to be locked in the prison of the tabernacle with Jesus, like in the Carmel. Um, and I'm just wondering, like, for like, you know, in St. Louis here, we have a Carmelite monastery with, you know, 20 nuns. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking for people who do this, like who really lock themselves out from the rest of the world they don't have the opportunity to travel and see the beautiful creation like in heaven will they be able to you know like i don't know so yes I'm... yes yeah <laughs> yes i mean what's that line from jesus you know those who follow me will um those who leave father and mother uh wife and husband will be given more like will be given a hundredfold even now, I mean, so, so Therese's sacrifice or the celibate sacrifice, and they'll tell you like they even already get a taste of more. Uh, it's so ironic in a way, but totally makes sense that St. Therese, who was locked in the cloister, is the patrons, patroness of the missions worldwide. <laughs> and like you can find her statue or painting of her in almost every Catholic church in the world. Like she's everywhere. So somehow, yeah, in a mystical way, as you press into the, when you give yourself to him and that concentration of knowledge on him, you get like, you, you get everything back. And I think, yeah, as the experience of eschatological man, this cosmos, this cosmological angle here is, yeah, there's no lack, there's no void, there's a fullness. Um, and when you think about earthly life, I mean, it's like a puff of smoke. I mean, it's over so quickly. Um, some of us, right, as we're getting older, I mean, we the old gray beard here, um, as we're getting older, for, for my kids, you know, COVID-19 probably feels like 10 years. It's been 10 years. For me, it's starting to feel like 10 years, but it's, it's still, <laughs> it's a blip. Um, but life will just sort of wrap up and it's like, okay, we're here. Wow. And everything's, everything's received. Everything's gifted. Everything. Okay. Any other um, thoughts before we maybe take, pull out another sentence? Anything getting um, stirred up? 
Okay. Let's see. There's so many ridiculous things to can read from. Um, I'm still in section four. Uh, let's do, uh, let's see, we finished off with the world, the world of persons and their psychosomatic constitution. So we're kind of in the last half of that paragraph of four. Certainly this is a union of communion. He says that quite a bit, a union of communion. The concentration of knowledge, which again, isn't just our head, but our heart knowledge and love on God himself in the Trinitarian communion of persons that he is, can find a beatifying response in those who will become sharers in the other world. Beatifying, blissful, right, ecstatic response in those who uh, will become sharers in the other world. We participate only through realizing, and here's those italics, right, where he's like, he's, he's getting intense, through realizing reciprocal communion commensurate with created persons, giving, receiving, giving, receiving. We're going to be doing this in heaven. Okay, we're not just filling bleachers, filling sta a stadium, and God's a big ball of light in the middle, but we're participants. Okay, we learned this from Vatican II, right? We participate in the liturgy. You, you know, back in the old days, my grandma and grandpa, they could sit in the back while the priest was uh, speaking Latin, and they're like saying rosaries and they got their little novena cards are going through and <laughs> it's kind of funny right it's like wait your mass is going on we've learned a lot um in the sense like wait i'm in this i i participate i'm in it i'm the reciprocal communion is that i i make a donation of myself i jump and i also am gifted back with it and it's this movement and for this reason we profess faith in the communion of saints. Okay, that's the awesome swimming in, swimming out of every other psychosomatic unity of a person in the whole world. And we profess it in organic connection with faith in the resurrection of the body. Organic connection, organic connection with faith in the resurrection of the body. I don't know what that's gonna look like, right? This is speculative theology. What's it going to look like to be able to, to, to see the eyes of Jesus, to touch? I've often thought about this, to smell. Like, what smell in heaven? You know how everybody's got a smell. You walk into somebody's house and there's a smell. Um, yeah. sometimes, sometimes it's a real interesting smell. But <laughs> there's smell in heaven, too. Katie, you're laughing. I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> so there, there's also that. We have, to, we have to get this point. This is... Um, because it's all bodily, right? It's bodily, it has all those senses involved. And so the reciprocal communion is I really, I get to taste and see that the Lord is good, but also everybody else. Wow. And I know all of you and me, we've all had moments where there's something about another person, maybe it's a family member, a friend, a beloved, like there's some, like sometimes it's an intoxicating thing, you know, like the way their hair shines or their laugh or the, their, maybe there's a smell or um, just the way they do something like we just, we just love it. Like, oh my gosh, you know, we, we just love something about that person. It's enjoying all those little gems of, of humanity and all their idiosyncrasies. Okay. It's so like a trillion, how many human beings have existed? They, they exist forever, by the way. Is it a trillion? Trillions? Each unique and unrepeatable. See, this is, this is why heaven will never be boring. Eschatological man is not, cannot be boring. Even like a million years in. I mean, we can't even use time measurements, right? But it's not like, you know, oh, I already experienced that. <laughs> yeah, so what else is on? You know, there, nobody <laughs> has a clicker in heaven. Like, is there anything else on? <laughs> right? What's on Disney Plus right now? Is there anything else? <laughs> We will never, ever, ever get bored because of this reciprocal communion. Um, okay, let's look. Uh, I'm going to jump down a little bit. I'm sorry if it's hard to follow, but we, we should think of the reality of the other world in the categories of the rediscovery. I love when he uses that word. Of a new 
perfect subjectivity of each person. I gotta read this really slowly. Okay, think of the reality of heaven as a rediscovery of a new perfect subjectivity of each person. And at the same time, the rediscovery of a new perfect intersubjectivity of all. Okay, pause right there. Has anybody ever had like a, a rupture in a friendship or in a marriage was a difficult thing and you're like, ah, or you, you know, a friend's calling you like, ah, you know, we have this riff, we have this like block or, you know, uh, we used to hang out, you know, all those little, those little blockades that kind of form or, you know, in, in a marriage maybe where it's been going on for years and there's just certain things or it's just, uh, what was he getting at here? This rediscovery of perfect intersubjectivity means those aren't issues anymore. The very things that used to drive me nuts or that annoyed me, they're cleaned, purified, made translucent, and I'm not offended anymore. I'm not annoyed. God has washed us clean. Does this make sense? He has washed us clean. The, and so the glorified body now, the glorified personality, the glorified temperament, the glorified person, is all light, but also still subject, the perfect subjectivity. What does that mean? Perfect subjectivity means you, you're the subject. I'm a subject, you know, like coming to know in heaven, please God, we all make it there. I will know Scott. I will know Bernadette. I will know Ed. We'll, we'll know. And, and there won't be speed bumps. Everything will be a sort of invitation deeper in. Okay. Um, I think we should probably pause. This is this is an overwhelming audience. Nick, why did you why did you have to do this to us? Why did you do this? This is an overwhelming audience. We do them all. Oh my gosh! Um, you joined at the right time. Yes. yes, yes. Uh, let me just pause. So I, I I should jump in like ten minutes, but um, nine minutes. But this is important. I'll just uh, final thought here on this audience. This is all relevant to life right now in the world. This is very relevant. This is not escapist theology. This isn't like pie in the sky or can I read something that'll get me out of this COVID-19 quarantine? I'm so exhausted. Yeah. I need a release. All of this is extremely important and relevant right now. And it helps us deal with stuff. Okay, we don't have to um, be afraid that we're, you know, FOMO, fear of missing out. You know, oh my gosh, all this time we've been in quarantine and we're still wearing masks and it's so frustrating. We don't, the, the world is not opaque, like like thick, like a curtain. This meditation on eschatological man is like, wait a minute, ah, this is, I'm okay. It's all going to be good, right? All shall be well in all things, all shall be well. So I just want to encourage you, don't, this is never, this is not escapism. This breathes life into the now. And I, you know, I can deal with the craziness of, of the world right now, because there's there's another world. Okay, um, pause. Any any just general thoughts, insights, sharings, questions? I have one quick question. Bernadette. It's yeah. totally unrelated. Um, I've always wondered what the difference is between um, when um, there's quotes around a word, and the words are italicized. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like where he, he's I know that, here, the, the other world that will take neither yes. wife nor husband yeah i know he italicizes for emphasis but then sometimes there's quotation marks around certain words i know that i don't know if it's yeah, emphasis might, also yeah that's a great question bernard i mean he might just be it's sort of like a colloquial way of you know, somehow, sometimes we do air quotes for things. Right, right. <laughs> Maybe he's, it's John Paul doing air quotes. Um, <laughs> sometimes it may be referring to a scripture passage that he's just like grabbing a piece of. Oh, um, yeah. Okay. You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that's a good question. I'm not really sure. Okay. Thank you. I mean, I know when he says like in section five, he's got the word beginning in quotation marks. So we know he's referring through the quotes to Genesis, you know, in the, the beginning, right. it was not so. So maybe mm -hmm. that. Okay. 
Anybody else? What's uh, what's kind of zapping you? What's what's your kind of takeaway from this audience? So for me, I'm very, very practical because I teach seventh graders. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things I did this week, I, I thought I was teaching them about the language of the body. And normally I usually get the kids to get up and do charades, but on Zoom, that's like impossible. <laughs> and And actually, you know, they're all very sleepy and even on zoom they don't want to show me their faces so i just see their heads mm. you know no matter how many times i tell them to angle the 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 uh, picture down so i can see their faces uh you know it's a constant battle but anyway so i showed them a series of beautiful pictures of people mm. you know old people bill some of them are from you know the a way of beauty the, the yeah. pictures you know yeah and so i so I told them to um, tell me what these people were feeling. That was the first thing because I wanted them to make the, the connection with the body speaks a language. And, you know, we know what people are saying to us just by their actions. They don't have to do words. I also showed them a Charlie Chaplin uh, movie, but Clever. what, what I um, figured out at the end was so I had them go all the way through telling me the emotions. And then I decided to go backwards. And I said, tell me more about these people. Mm. Look at them. What is their story? Can you think about that? That's so good. And then at the end, I, this is God given. I said, this is how God looks at you deeply, fully. Mm. But you have to start living this now don't take each other for granted mm. because it's, because the thing is like when i talk to kids about eschatological man they still in their minds are thinking of angels sitting on clouds yep. no matter yep. what i say to them because it's such a uh it's not concrete for them so i think that this is how to move them to the understanding of eschatological men live fully every moment don't waste it look at the person look at nature like those beautiful pictures you show with your kids you know mm -hmm. looking at leaves and all that <laughs> so anyways that was my little project this week i was, love it you're, you're yeah. trying to land them in the real that's the phenomenology land them in the real and get them to uh and you know, it's beautiful. You referenced those pictures. I'm going to put in the chat uh, the work of two photojournalists who are like really, really good. And they love the human face. Um, one is Steve McCurry, uh, who's worked for decades for National Geographic, I think. And then Lee Jeffries, who's chronicled lives of the homeless. So I just put in the chat both their websites. Yeah, get, get them in there because like these are people and they're, and they're amazing miracles and get lost in their eyes and their culture and their everything about them um there's a lot of great stuff out there that you can use i love that you're doing that michelle and the story the idea of the story of oh, each the accident. what's that it was an accident <laughs> it was kind of an accident <laughs> happy accident oh happy fall oh felix culpa of michelle <laughs> um anybody i have just a couple minutes sorry nick just two minutes left <laughs> Oh, it's not good. Thank is you. the movie sold worth watching? Is it a good movie? It's, um, I watched it twice. I watched it this week again to prepare for this the podcast thing, but um, it's got its moments. If you try to let go, like from a TOB perspective, there's some, it's like funky and, you know, but if you center in on the, the main thrust of the film is the gift of the present. We obsess about so much. There's a main line that's like, the lost souls are those who obsess even about good things. They obsess and they idolatrize it and then they're lost. But if you let the gift of the present flow over you, you, you appreciate your life. There are some real gems in it um, and some great jazz music. It's good. It's a great soundtrack too. <laughs> okay. So yeah, throw a little holy water and uh, enjoy. <laughs> <laughs> That's um, what I heard. <laughs> anybody else final thought or comment? Well, I have a question. Sarah. On, on the third, um, the third point, mm -hmm. it just says, 
as a consequence of the vision of God face to face. What does that mean? Oh, I see it. It's the last line of section three. Yes. Um, oh, it's one of those big sentences. In yeah. this way, the eschatological situation, the experience of heaven, mm -hmm. in which they will take neither wife nor husband, has its solid foundation in the future state of the personal subject. Oh, man, these sentences. <laughs> <laughs> when, as a consequence of the vision of God face to face, a love of such depth and power of concentration on God himself will be born in the person that it completely absorbs the person's whole psychosomatic subjectivity. Okay. Oh, you know what? That's that's the reason we have the big ball of light thought in our head about heaven. Okay. That's the reason we have, because it will be completely overwhelming. It's the infinite God who is beauty and truth and goodness. This idea that we that we are completely absorbed in him. That's the fruit of the face-to-face. -face. The key is though, yeah, so it means that we get lost in love. We get lost in love, which is a great uh, air supply song from the 80s. Lost <laughs> in love and I don't know love. That one? So, Google that. But the key of the theology of the body is I don't lose my personal subjectivity. My psychosomatic subjectivity is still intact. I don't like diffuse into the ball of light i do get lost in it but i also get found in it okay that's why john paul says we have a rediscovery of ourselves does that make sense so it's this both yeah. end of like um and we get a little taste on earth sometimes of of ecstatic moments of like wow and we feel like we've just like got lost in the glory of that whatever it was but we don't disintegrate. We're like, oh, we come back and we're like, wow, 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 wow. We feel it. You know? <laughs> so it's yeah. like the tension. Okay. I would love to keep going for another hour, but I got to go and talk about a movie. <laughs> Sorry, gang. This is so Thank much fun. You. Thank you. Thank you. Can we we'll pray for you. Yeah, you. All right. I'm going to keep talking, gang. Keep, yes. Peace. Thank Thank you. You. Peace, love, and T.O.B. Okay. Thank you so much. Bye-bye, okay, gang. That was cool. <laughs> that was awesome.